Welcome back. 34 past the hour. Well, one of the big stories the past week, as you know, involves Pastor Mark Driscoll of Mars Hill Church spending at least $210,000 to buy his way onto the New York Times bestseller list with his plagiarized book, Real Marriage. But, of course, this isn't the only scandal involving Driscoll or other celebrity pastors, because, as you know, prior to the book buying scandal, Driscoll was embroiled and still is in the longstanding plagiarism scandal. I had uncovered plagiarism in four of his books. Others have revealed at least three other books and a sermon in which he did plagiarize again. And additionally, celebrity pastor Stephen Furtick has been in the news. Local TV station there in his area exposed his mansion, his secrecy there at the church over finances, and even an oft mocked celebrity pastor coloring book page featuring, of course, Stephen Furtick. Now, the world has taken notice of these scandals, but what's been amazing to me in all this is how much silence there is inside the Christian subculture about all of it with just a few exception, exceptions to this rule. Now, does this speak to a deeper problem of corruption that we might be tolerating when the big names are caught in scandal? Well, for that, we're turning to Dr. Carl Truman. He has a great piece out about it at the Reformation 21 blog. Dr. Truman is speaker on the Mortification of Spin podcast, professor of church history at Westminster Theological Seminary, pastor of Cornerstone Presbyterian Church, and always a delight to welcome you, Dr. Truman. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, I love what you write, as you know, and I know we have talked about this issue of celebrity in the church before. First of all, what do you make of the latest Driscoll scandal, just off the top? Well, I I have almost an ambivalent response to it, really. On one level, I think this is a deep, it's a deep tragedy for the church, because in the eyes of the world, we're all part of the same movement. So when a high-profile public leader is caught with his hands in the cookie jar, is caught in a bad situation. I think the reputation of the church as a whole suffers. So on one level, I feel, to be honest, I feel a certain amount of shame uh, for the church at this point uh, and uh, and the church to which we all all belong. On another level, I think it it does not surprise me at all. I think when you have uh, a mix of powerful personalities, big organizations, and, and lots of money at stake, then ultimately corners get cut, things get done that shouldn't be done. So it doesn't surprise me, but it it greatly disappoints me, if I could put it that way. Well, that's right. And you've touched on a number of really important things. One is this issue of having powerful organizations. Now, you think about what Jesus did, washing his disciples' feet and being a servant himself, the Lord of glory, coming down and condescending to become a man and and being a servant and telling us all as Christians, we are to be servants, we are to be humble, we are to, you know, be as, uh, you know, centered on Christ and not ourselves as anything. And yet we have this whole celebrity culture that seems to really be doing two things. On the one hand, it's preaching Christ. To some extent, they're talking about Jesus. They're saying that they're preaching the gospel. But when you look at the structure around it, how does that speak in an opposite direction on the issue of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to project what Jesus wants us to project, which is godliness? Yeah, I think your question raises two very, very significant points there. On the one hand, we must rejoice when, when there are men who are able to get the gospel out and get it out to audiences that I can't reach, that your radio program can't reach, that the church on the corner can't reach. We should rejoice in that. I mean, that the gospel is being preached is a, a delight and should be a delight to Christians. On the other hand, I think when we start to build the, the kind of structures that allow us to have that sort of reach, Transparency and accountability are absolutely critical. Uh, I, you know, I have to be honest with you. If somebody started paying me hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if my face was on everything my church produced, if I had tens of thousands of people downloading my sermons every week, I think it would corrupt me. I don't think I could cope with that kind of exposure and pressure. I think that uh, I'm a sinner and would therefore very, very rapidly succumb to the blandishments of that kind of thing. And that's why it's important that we have people in place who can hold us to account, point the leaders, the preachers to Christ uh, as as model and as savior as well. That's the only way I think one can maintain godliness in the ministry, being held to account by, by others. Right. But if you are lacking a denominational structure, for example, and not that that's a perfect system either, but if you're lacking any real oversight, how would you rein in somebody who makes hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars and has a big empire of sorts? How do you keep somebody like that accountable? Well, I don't think you can. Um, 
I, again, as you say, a denominational structure doesn't solve things. I'm a Presbyterian, but I'm well aware that the history of Presbyterianism is full of its own problems. I think we have our problems, though, despite the fact that we've got a structure to deal with them. If you don't even have a structure that allows you to deal with things, you're only ever a couple of days away from a potential uh, corruption scandal, I would say. Right. Well, Dr. Carl Truman joining me. We're going to come back talking about the celebrity culture in the church and who is really responsible for this. We'll come back right after this on The Janet Mefford Show. We're back 44 past the hour chatting with Dr. Carl Truman from Westminster Theological Seminary about this problem of celebrity pastors. We see this latest scandal with Mark Driscoll in the book buying scandal, $200,000 at least to buy his way onto the New York Times bestseller list to promote his book. And this is just the latest scandal we've seen come not just from him, but from celebrity culture in the church. And, you know, one of the questions, Dr. Truman, I think needs to be asked is how do the people of God allow a Driscoll to get to the point where he's at. I mean, this this really speaks not just about those who are celebrity pastors, but it speaks a lot about the people in the churches, doesn't it? It does. I, I think everybody's intimidated a bit by success. I mean, I, I can hear the reactions now. You know, Truman's a pastor of a church of 150 people. He's just jealous. Mm. So I think there's, there's always that uh, element there. I think that a lot of these guys have very slick rhetoric. I noticed in the some of the stuff that was coming out last week, the old uh, the line was being played, yes, but we're telling a lot of people about Jesus. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing, telling a lot of people about Jesus, but, you know, it, you know I'm a pastor. I tell people about Jesus every Sunday. It doesn't mean I can sleep with my neighbor's wife on the Monday. Right. Um, you've got to be very careful, I think, how you use the I'm telling people about Jesus rhetoric to, to give you a free pass on, on other aspects of your behavior. And I also think there's, you know, we, Mark Driscoll was part of this, the Young, Restless, and Reform movement, which, from my perspective, had many good things to commend it. Uh, but I think there's been a reticence of, of the, the upper echelons of that movement to engage in any public criticism of each other, even as their ways have parted, and even as the behavior of some of the characters involved has really passed beyond the pale. Yes. Uh, the failure to take a strong public stand on on a number of issues has been, I think, eloquent. Uh, I wouldn't speculate about the reasons for it, but it, is, it has been rather eloquent in terms of the, the moral fiber of the movement, I think, as it's developed. Well, and that's wrong. How can you lead other Christians and stand up for the truth if you're not willing to call out error when you see it? None of us is above the Word of God. Yeah, I think there is a, a culture, again, in this big conference circuit where if you're an eloquent conference speaker and you're able to attract donors, uh, that is what you consider to be leadership. Well, leadership is actually making tough choices, uh, taking hard stands, alienating donors and alienating sections of a constituency if they're not good for the gospel. And I think that's something we've seen lacking in the leadership of the YRR over the last couple of years. And that's tragic. You have a quote here in this piece that you wrote at Reformation 21, which just knocked my socks off because I think you're right. You said, we who are associated with the so-called reformed evangelical movement, whether because we want to be or because others just make the connection, now look as corrupt and worldly as the despicable televangelists of a previous generation. Strong statement, but I can't argue with you on that. Yeah, it's certainly how my non-Christian friends would view it. Uh, I've repeatedly say in class at Westminster to students that we need to make sure that it's not just our theology that divides us from the televangelists. We need to make sure that the way we conduct ourselves and live our lives distinguishes us from them as well. And mm-hmm. I just don't think that that is, is evidence at the upper echelons of the movement these days. Well, and don't you think part of the disease is this idea that because we have sound doctrine, we can overlook other things. As long as a guy has a good sound doctrinal statement and he's preaching Jesus, quote unquote, how he's living his life can be overlooked because after all, it's all about grace. I mean, isn't that really cheap grace if we're looking at it that way? I think so. I mean, Paul makes it very clear in the pastoral epistles what caliber of person is to lead the church. And ability to teach is one of the qualifications, but every other qualification there has to do with character and morals. Yes. Well, do you think that there's this double standard, though, that those who qualify as celebrities can get away with it? I have seen more than one celebrity pastor 
get up in front of his audience slash congregation after a scandal has been announced and just laugh it away or say, this is what happens. We get attacked and it's all love and applause. And I thought even Jimmy Swaggart got up in front of the TV cameras and cried when his scandal was exposed. (laughs) What happened to the crying? (laughs) Yeah, we're worse than Swaggart. That's a terrible, terrible thing to think of, isn't it? Well, I mean, you and I both know that when you raise criticism of these guys, you can expect a phone call. You can expect the, the emails, um, you know, we both had direct experience of some of the men that, that we're alluding to at this point. And it's, you know, it's a sad and sleazy state of affairs, quite frankly, when it's come to behind the scenes bullying to try to, to keep the critics silent. Oh, yeah. I, I hear you on that. Now, what about the uh, going back to the Jimmy Swagger crying thing for a moment, because I want to get your take on this. Back in the 80s, when we saw the Jim and Tammy Baker scandal and the Jimmy Swaggart scandal, at least they didn't remain. I mean, later, Jimmy Swaggart came and got a much smaller ministry. Now he's still kind of on TV, but he was he was sullied. He was done pretty much after that scandal. Nowadays, it seems all you have to do is have a good PR team, put out a good statement, obfuscate, tweet Bible verses. And if you wait long enough, a la Bill Clinton, it'll just all go away. Why is it not Stopped. I don't understand what is wrong with the church today that these things are not stopped and fixed. Uh, too much money involved on the one side, and I think that in North American, well, in American culture, uh, success is the ultimate absolution. As long as you're successful, you can pretty much get away with anything. That's so sad, though. I mean, I, I have commented a few times, for example, on uh, this actor, Shia LaBeouf, and he plagiarized some material in a film and then plagiarized again with an apology. He's finished. He said he's finished in Hollywood. He shows up at an event not too long ago with a bag over his head. And I look at that and I see Driscoll making a mistakes were made statement over one of the seven books he's plagiarized and nothing else. And I think the world deals better with at least the issue of plagiarism than the church does. That makes us look like fools. Going back to what you said before, it brings shame on all of us and on the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it's fascinating to me that the church has started to adopt the rhetoric of, of politicians caught in, uh, caught in corrupt situations. You know, mistakes have been made. Things were regrettable. I acted in an unwise manner. You know, we're Christians. We believe in sin. We also believe in forgiveness. Yeah. If you've sinned, confess your sin, right. place yourself under the discipline of your elders, and look for forgiveness. Forgiveness won't be withheld. We, right. we believe in forgiveness. It's the essence of our religion. That's right. Uh, but there seems to be this complete inability on the part of those who've essentially set themselves up as our leaders, though nobody ever elected them, uh, to name the sin. That's so true. Dr. Carl Truman with us. We're going to go to another break. We'll come back right after this talking about the celebrity culture in the church. Stay with us. Five minutes before the hour, Dr. Carl Truman joining me from Westminster Theological Seminary and makes such great points in his latest piece at Reformation 21 about this celebrity culture in the church. We see the Mark Driscoll scandal of the day of the week about the results source scandal uh, involving buying his way onto the New York Times bestseller list. And thus far, we haven't seen any tears. We haven't seen any real repentance. We've seen a board statement from the church in which they fully back Pastor Driscoll. I mean, how in the world can you get up with a straight face after this point without repentance, Dr. Truman? I I just don't know. I mean, when you think of the sums of money involved, 210000 I think, was quoted at some point. Yep. These are vast sums of money. It's the Lord's money. It's money that's been given by people who presumably earn much less than that. Uh, Minimally, uh, there should be deep public shame when you've been exposed in in this kind of way. It's staggering. It is staggering. What do you think would be the proper biblical response of Mark Driscoll at this point? Well, if... uh... If it was me at my church, I could say what would have happened in, in, in the context of a Presbyterian church if I'd been, say, accused of plagiarism or accused of, of you know, using funds to, to puff one of my books or something. So there would have been a, a judicial process where I'd actually have been put on trial by uh, fellow ministers who would have allowed me to defend myself in a church context, and then uh, I would either have been exonerated or placed under some form of church discipline, which maximally could have been excommunication. More likely, I think, in this sort of scenario, a 
suspension or a, a removal from the from the ministry. Right. So we'd have definite processes for dealing with it. When you've got a one-man band and the whole business is really built upon the reputation of the one man, it's very difficult to, to do something like that. Well, if he stays at the helm of his church and nothing further is done in the way of repentance or at all, uh, what does this say about American evangelicalism? Um, I think for a guy like me, it confirms my deepest fears that uh, in many ways it's, it, 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 it represents certain very egregious aspects of wider American culture, uh, a wider Western culture. I I'm, I'm conscious of being British, and I'm not trying to make a, a point about Americans here. It's okay. Uh, a wider, uh, you know, the wider malaise of, of Western culture, where, frankly, money and success are, are the gods. Well, that is really depressing to consider, but this is why we need to expose, you know, as Ephesians talks about, uh, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. It's important for sin to come out so we can forgive people who will come forward with sorrow and repent and see what happens from there. But I thank you so much, Dr. Carl Truman, who's been so great on mortification of spin and on the great pieces that you write over at Reformation 21, exposing this culture of celebrity and calling us to a biblical way of thinking. Thank you so much, Dr. Truman. Thanks for having me on.